Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about the archaeological evidence for complex cognition in the Middle Stone Age of South Africa. What do I mean by complex cognition? In the simplest terms, complex cognition implies the ability to think in the way that we do today. And in defining the Middle Stone Age in the South African context, I talk about industries that appear with the earliest anatomically modern humans about 300,000 years ago. But as we heard from Alison a little earlier, um, the Middle Stone Age um, technology may go back as far as 500,000 years ago. I'm choosing some attributes of complex cognition to talk about today. The use of symbols, planning for remote action, that is when the human actor is some distance from what is going to take place. Thirdly, the practice of delayed gratification, which we can also call response inhibition. And an example of that is when people collect ostrich eggs from a cache and leave some of them behind for the ostrich to hatch out. The ability to multitask, the ability to be flexible in problem solving, understanding transformation, and by that I mean technological trans transformation. Transformation being um, the, the change, for example, in, in um, artifacts that are irreversibly changed. So a number of ingredients irreversibly changed. And finally, the use of analogical reasoning. These attributes are likely to have been incremental. They would not have arrived as a package. I have chosen four South African sites to give the examples from. Three of them are in the Cape, Deep Kloof, Pinnacle Point, and Blombos. And the fourth one is in KwaZulu-Natal at Sabudu. Blombos is a tiny cave site, it's a coastal site, and it's yielded a number of amazing artifacts that I'll be showing you in a moment. The site was excavated and is being excavated by Chris Henschelwood. The ages here go back to about 100,000 years ago. Pinnacle Point, excavated by Curtis Marion, also a series of coastal sites um, on a cliff, and the ages here go back to about 160,000 years ago. Deep Kloof, inland, this is a rock shelter that was excavated by a French team directed by Texia and Perez, and um, in collaboration with the South African team directed by John Parkington um, and Cedric Pochenpool. And Subudu, which I've excavated up until 2011, it's now being excavated by Nicholas Connard. This site is perched on a cliff in an evergreen forest about 15 kilometers inland from the sea, and its ages go back to about 77,000 years ago. So the first attribute, the introduction of symbolic thought. One of the things that denote this is the, the introduction of perforated shells. At Blombos, the, the age there is about 71,000 years ago, and these are Nasarius shells, many of them. At Subudu, it's a different species, Afrolitarina and Welk shells, but the age is also 71,000 years ago. The importance of having these perforated shells is that these ornaments, because we believe they are ornaments, are markers of self or group identity, which in turn is an indicator of symbolism. Then both Blombos and Sabudu feature here again with the presence of engraved ochre. The Blombos ones are really famous. They go back about 100,000 years ago. And the best known of these is on the left-hand side, the one with the cross hatching. <coughs> At Sabudu, we don't tend to get cross-hatching designs. There, the designs are more fan-like, as you see at the bottom. And the age for the Sabudu ones like that is 77,000 years ago. Deep Kloof Rock Shelter is well known for its engraved ostrich eggshell. 
These come from perforated water bottles. On the top right are the perforations that you can see on these pieces of water bottle and the decorations, the engravings over on the left here. What is most noticeable about the, the deep kloof engravings is that the patterns tend to be these ladder-like designs. And these are repeated on hundreds of pieces of the eggshell, suggesting that we're dealing here with a cultural tradition, not something um, that was uncommon at all. In the Kalahari today, such ostrich eggshells are used as water bottles. Only a few of them are decorated, and you can see one example there on the right. But the most compelling evidence for complex cognition, I believe, comes from everyday tasks, and so I'm going to be talking mostly about those. The introduction of snaring implies planning for remote action and response inhibition. So the setting of a trap implies that the hunter is going to gain meat without actually seeing the prey that comes to the snare or the trap. And at Subudu, there is evidence for this, circumstantial evidence, about 71,000 years ago. The fauna there is dominated by blue dacre, a very tiny animal that lives in the forest and would certainly not be sensibly caught either with arrow or with spear. Then the bush pig, which is nocturnal, um, extremely dangerous to hunt, and so far more likely to have been caught in a pit trap. And then the tiny carnivores, things like mongooses, these are not susceptible to being caught in, in um, nets, so we can probably eliminate the possibility of nets, but they are susceptible to being caught in snares. I think one of the most convincing bits of evidence for advanced planning and multitasking comes through the introduction in the Middle Stone Age of compound adhesives. I have to tell you the difference between a compound adhesive and a glue. A glue is a simple product, like a plant gum, whereas a compound adhesive is a combination of ingredients. And the combination of ingredients that I'm talking about here is plant gum, like acacia, together with ochre powder. We found stone artifacts both at Rose Cottage and Subudu that have these compound adhesives on them. And so in order to try and understand how they were made, I did some experiments to transform a combination of powdered ochre and acacia gum into a compound adhesive. The advanced planning comes with collecting the materials. The acacia gum has to be collected. Um, the, the ochre powder needs to be ground from pieces that can often need to be collected from great distances. Then the important thing about this is that these natural ingredients differ quite considerably depending on season and where they are collected. And the end result of that is that there is no set recipe like a cake recipe that can be used for making these compound adhesives. Sometimes the acacia gum or the other plant gum is runny and more ochre powder needs to be added. On other occasions, the gum is stiff and so less ochre powder needs to be added. And so this is all about thinking on your feet while you're making these things, switching attention, changing plan, and indeed multitasking. But the really compelling evidence here for multitasking is once the, the person has uh, mounted the adhesive onto the shaft and attached the stone tool and then needs to heat this to dehydrate the, the adhesive on the tools. And so it's the control of the fire that is ultimately so important. If the fire is too hot, the adhesives will, will boil and bubble and get air bubbles and be useless, or they may burn if they're too close to the fire. And so without um, temperature mechanisms, people in the Middle Stone Age would have had to gauge 
how warm the fire was and how suitable it was for dehydrating without spoiling these tools. So, a good example, in short, of multitasking. Here are compound adhes adhesives at Subudu by 71,000 years ago. Though the examples pictured here are, in fact, 65,000 years ago. Over on the left um, is a segment, and I think that you can see there is ochre adhesive attached there, whereas the tool on the right has a different recipe. And that recipe has no ochre in it, but it has black fat. And in the centre, you can see the microscopic images that go along with each of these tools. The tool on the left has indeed ochre on it under the microscope and plant gum up at the top, whereas the, the tool on the right has fat on the top image um, and a series of black fat and white fat if you look carefully at it. The importance of these different recipes for compound adhesive is that the ochre was not necessarily used symbolically when the adhesive was made. If it was used symbolically only within these recipes, we would expect that all the adhesives used at the site would have had ochre um, in them so that the hunt was always successful. And that was not the case. There were different recipes. The introduction of compound paint, which we see at Blombos at about 100,000 years ago, follows exactly the same principle. Although it's not compound adhesive, it's a compound paint made of ochre, charcoal, crushed fatty bone, quartz grains, and an unknown liquid. My latest work has involved heat treating of rocks. And the heat treating of rocks in the past, I believe, believe indicates analogical reasoning. Let's have a look at why that would be the case. Some researchers using electrical furnaces have suggested that it's not necessary to bury siliceous rocks underground in order to heat them successfully. However, my experiments with fires, which behave a little bit differently from electrical furnaces, suggest that that's not true. At the top left, I buried silkweed slabs, which I cut into two different sizes to um, imitate the preforms that might have been used for the manufacture of stone tools. Once I'd buried those, I put similar blocks of silkweed on top of the ground, laid the fire on top of that, lit it, and subsequently scraped off a coal bed on which a third set of silkweed blocks were cut. In short, the silkweed blocks that were buried underground preserved perfectly, whereas both the ones in the fire and on the coal bed fractured, as you see in the bottom left picture. One of the experimental fire temperatures is shown on the right. The upper graph shows the temperatures in centigrade of the fire itself. I want you to notice how the, the temperature ramps up very quickly within the first five minutes is a little bit uneven and then drops extremely quickly. Whereas the underground temperatures depicted here rise slowly, fall slowly, and maintain a very nice curve in the middle. And the temperatures here are between 300 and 400 degrees, exactly the temperature that is needed to transform silkrete. Let me explain why this should happen. When silkrete is heated, it changes its structure. It becomes more fine-grained and the pore waters in the centre evaporate out. If this all happens too quickly, then the silkrete fractures. And that's why the underground temperatures are ideal for making this transformation. And why is it analogical reasoning? simply because in order to get the underground temperatures that are required, the above ground temperatures need to be controlled very carefully. 
Here are the archaeological examples that suggest that heat treatment did take place in the Middle Stone Age. At Blombos, at 71,000 years ago, there are some points, A and B, that demonstrate heat treatment. The way that heat treatment can be seen in these artifacts is that when a piece of rock is heated underground or heated at all and then struck, the, the flakes that have been removed um, show a gloss, a luster. Whereas the exterior of the rock that has not been struck does not show that luster. So both experimentally and archaeologically, we can see that there were preforms, pre-shapes laid down um, to be heated and that they were subsequently flaked. And Kyle Brown has done experiments with Pinnacle Point Rock and has looked at some of the, the tools from the site to demonstrate that those have been heat treated. In summary, let's have a look at the, the selected evidence that I've given you for the attributes of complex cognition in the Middle Stone Age. First, symbolism expressed through group or individual identity. Then the long-term planning for remote action and response inhibition through the circumstantial evidence for snaring. Multitasking through the, the, the manufacture of compound adhesives and compound paint. This also shows the ability to be flexible in problem solving. Then the concept of transformation is also present in these comp compound adhesives and paints, but also in the heating um, of siliceous rocks, in which I also suggest that analogical reasoning, which may be one of the cores of our modern thinking, is also visible. Thank you. <laughs>